welcome to Munda Makeover. We have traveled all over Zambia to find hard-working farmers. We want to share their success stories. And where there are challenges, we will bring experts to help them gain the extra knowledge they need. So they can adapt and make their farms more productive even while the climate changes. We want to support them to get better yields. And increase their income. We will see how farmers from across the country can benefit from our experts' advice. While also learning from each other in so many ways. Join us on these journeys and share in the farmers' experiences as they improve their farms. On Munda Makeover! Hey Katanana. Yes, Cozy. Have you heard the saying, out with the old and in with the new? Are you saying one of us is old and the other is new? I hope not. <laughs> what I'm saying is, out with the old ways of farming mm. and in with the new ways. Ah, because this week we're visiting a farm that's packed with new ideas. And we plan to introduce even more of our own. So, out with the old and in with the new. Let's go. This week, we're in Moise in Eastern Province and we're visiting Chirua Chrisave. Chirua is married to Margaret and they have eight children. The farm covers 30 hectares with 18 currently under cultivation. They farm maize, vegetables, sunflower and groundnut. And they have 19 cows and chickens too. So let's go and meet him. Hello. Hello. How are you? Fine, how are you? My name is Kozyani. I'm well, thank you. My name is Chua Kriseves. I'm Kachanana and I'm happy to be here. Can I say hello to? Hello. Oh, how are, <laughs> are you mad at me? Okay, you can go. Bye. Right. <laughs> now, Mr. Chua. We hear you're a thoroughly modern farmer. Mm. Can you show us some of the things that you have going on here? Yes, I can show you. But surely you must have some challenges as well. Mm. Definitely, the challenges are the climate change. Okay, ah. how is it affecting you? It affects me because last season the rains came red. Ah. Mm. But I think we have just the right experts to help you with solutions to that problem, don't you think? Yes, we do. And we'd also like to learn from you as well. Thank you. Yes. Right, so we're going to go off now to meet with our experts and we'll see you later. See you. See you. When I heard that the Munda makeover will be coming to my farm, I was very excited. Out with the old and in with the new. Time to find out about conservation agriculture. I'm bringing Betty from the Ministry of Agriculture to meet our farmer Chirwa. She has some great advice on how to protect your crops from the effects of drought, even as the climate changes. How would you define conservation agriculture? Conservation agriculture is whereby you maintain the grounds mm. so that the soil fertility is improved. Yeah. As the soil fertility is being improved, it means that even the crops which you grow there, they are also going to be healthy. And at the end of it all, you are going to have a good yield. What would you say are the principles of conservation agriculture? There are actually three. Mm -hmm. The first one is that you do the minimum tillage, what we call minimum tillage. Mm -hmm. You don't disturb the land. You only concentrate where you're going to plant the crop mm. so that the whole land is just as it is. Exactly. Mr. Chirua, are you practicing minimum tillage? Exactly, I do practice. Okay. I do it with the mechanization system. Okay. Using the planters. Okay. Conservation agriculture, you can as well use hand hoes, okay. which we call chaka hoes, mm. or the organization which has just mentioned, okay. which are the reaper. You said there are three principles. The second principle is actually where you maintain the land with the cover. Mm. It could be the crop cover or mm. any other residue which is supposed to be in the food. For example, this. The mm. soils are not really well covered. You can see there are some spaces here, ah. there are some spaces there, there are also some spaces there. So it needs but to be completely yes, covered? Yes, it, it needs to be completely covered mm. and at the same time only where the plants will be planted, mm. that's where the plants will be opened. Mm. So for example like here, at least this shows that uh, there's a bit of uh, residue covered. Where there are the leaves the, Where there are the okay. leaves, yes. 
So this is good for conservation agriculture. Exactly. So what do these leaves really do exactly? How do they protect the soil when they're covering like this? When the rains come, mm. if the soils are not yeah. covered, mm. they could easily be run off. Oh, okay. Meaning that there will be even soil erosion. Ah. But at the same time, if we have soil cover, mm. it means that the moisture will be retained. Wow, that's very interesting. Mr. Chira, are you practicing this principle of conservation on your farm? Yes, I do practice it. Okay. What are the benefits you've seen so far? I noticed that when there is drought, my crops don't dry up. There is enough moisture and nutrients for the seeds to germinate and produce enough food. When there's soil cover, even his crops, mm -hmm. there's enough moisture. Ah. Even if there's a drought, mm -hmm. at least the crops will still survive. Like here in Ilunda's district, you notice that the, uh, the climate change has really affected us in the sense that the rains were not enough. But uh, those who did conservation farming, for this season, which we are just coming from, they're the only farmers who have got something on the table. Okay, Miss Betty, you've told us two principles, and what is the third? The third one is actually crop rotation. Like this season, he plants the maize, mm. then the following season, he plants the soya beans. Mm. So what it means is that maize is a heavy feeder, meaning that the following year, we plant a legume crop, which has the capacity to do the nitrogen fixation in the soil. Okay, so what the maize has taken out in the next uh, season, you are putting a plant that's going to put back in. Does it make sense? Let's break it down. One, do not plow. Practice minimum tillage by ripping or opening up the soil where you want to plant. Two, do not remove or burn crop residue after harvest. Three, rotate crops to keep pests away and to get the most from the soil. Remember, conservation agriculture is a great way to keep moisture in the soil and protect crops even when there's a drought. So, Katanana, mm? what do you think about conservation agriculture? Cosy, it's simply the future, the future, the future, baby. <laughs> Joining a cooperative is not necessarily a new idea. They've been around a while. But how a cooperative works, that can be. Let's find out. Hello. I'm meeting Daisy Lunda from the Ministry of Agriculture. She's going to tell us all about the Moise Corp. It's part of the project fully funded by the European Union. Firstly, our farmers, their major source of income is farming. Mm -hmm. So working as an individual, they face a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. Firstly, they have to consider the cost of buying inputs. Right. And when you look at the distance where they purchase inputs from, it's very far. Right. Even when they produce the harvest, they have to consider transport costs where they are going to sell their produce. Right. The other challenges that they face as on an individual basis is labor. Okay. Most of our farmers, they grow up about two to five hectares. Wow. So working on an, as an individual on such a large piece of land, piece of land it's really a challenge. It can be. Mm. You consider planting, weeding, right. harvesting, and also knowledge, mm. skills. Mm. It's a challenge to work as an individual. You miss out on important information, right. skills. Right, I mean, I wouldn't want to be facing all of those challenges by myself. Mm. It's always easier to share the load mm. when yeah. you have someone right by your side, mm. and preferably many people by your side to work exactly. with. And, um, who are we going to be meeting today? Oh, we're going to meet a big farmer, Mr. Chira. Right. He's from uh, Chimaliro Cooperative. Right. So I'm sure they'll explain to you the benefits of being in a group. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely looking forward. Um, let's get to it. And here's Chira with his fellow farmers from the Moise Corps. Why is it better to be farming as a group? The government of today mm -hmm. wants the uh, groups to work together, mm -hmm. then they finance something into that group. Okay. You share knowledge to the group. Okay. We have seen a lot of benefits from this cooperative. It's easy for them to access finances. When they go to any financial institution mm -hmm. to help them with the resources that they will need for the benefit of the group, it will be easy for them to access that. Okay, now let's hear from the members 
and see what they think. Sometimes you buy inputs by yourself, and during planting, you realize you didn't buy the right input. It is better to decide as a group and buy as a group. If it's fertilizer, you buy as a group other than buying as an individual. Mm. From the group, with the help of the extension officer, they're able to share skills and knowledge. I have learned a lot from this group. For example, weed management, how to plant, and how to do the right spacing between crops from one crop to another crop. This is so much information that we're all gaining here. Weed management and learning how to correctly apply chemicals to ensure that they get a good crop. What else might we be learning uh, from group? From the group, we get to learn new things and we can go out and teach others. We cannot run any project without a business plan. Absolutely. So we have learned about how to come up with a, a business plan. By now I know how to write a business plan. Ah, fantastic. Yes. Yeah, that would be very good. If we go to one member's farm, it takes us only one day to prepare the land. Then the next day we move to another farm. Uh -huh. So as a group we share ideas, uh -huh. many ideas, uh -huh. how to cultivate. Uh -huh. I like that system a lot able to share knowledge through cultivating yeah, one neighbor's farm and the other neighbor's farm and the other neighbor's farm. Daisy, it's been absolutely amazing sitting here with the group and hearing these lovely stories of the benefits that they've been able to receive from the trainings, the labor, from being able to keep books, you know, keep records. All of this is being learned as a group. So, co-ops really help with training and sharing labor. But there's more. Kachanana is going to be finding out how co-ops help when it comes to harvest time. I'll be talking about how to get the best price for your crop at market. Interested? Keep watching. Daisy is here again to help explain how co-ops can help. It's all part of a project fully funded by the European Union. Mr. Chira, this is so much maize. How many people do you think it can feed? Thousands of people. What if it was just me alone? How many years can it feed me for? So many years. 2,000 yeah. years? E exactly, <laughs> because you can't manage to finish this. Since farming is a business, it brings income to me. So that is enjoyable. Mr. Chirwa, first things first. What crops are you planting this season? I will be planting maize and soya beans. Maize and soya beans, why? Because, you see, maize is for consumption, mm -hmm. soya beans is for cash to make me generate income. Ah, and speaking of generating income, what's the first thing that you do when you're planting that? Is to put the seed mm -hmm. into the soil. Okay, Daisy, is that it? Is that the first thing? Actually, that's not the first thing. No, what is? Uh, the first thing the farmer should think about mm. is to plan for the crop that the farmer is going to plant. To plan for the crop? Marketing should be the first thing, because farming is a business. Ah. Okay, so how do you go about this? So when the farmer is planning, should mm -hmm. think about the crop that he's going to market, mm -hmm. where he's going to sell that crop, mm -hmm. at what price that crop will be sold, mm -hmm. not forgetting the cost of the imports that will be involved, considering the area of land that he wants to work with. Okay, Daisy, sure. but how can a farmer get all that information when they're just at the beginning? They have uh, officers that can help them, extension officers. Mm. Even the marketing department at the Ministry of Agriculture can help mm. them. Tell me more about how you research the markets. So what a farmer should consider is that the cost mm. of imports for that particular crop, okay. the demand for that particular crop, the price mm -hmm. of the produce, mm -hmm. and the availability of the markets. Okay. Now, I would like to know now, Daisy, you've determined the market, you've planted your crop, and you've harvested your crop. What next? What is the next step? The farmer should think about aggregation. Okay. And aggregation is where each individual farmer brings their produce together at a particular point. That is important because it will help the farmer with um, transportation costs, mm -hmm. even bargaining power of their produce. Mm -hmm. They'll have a higher say in the price of their produce. Ah. So those are the ones in actual sense who have been involved in the production and they know their costs. Oh, okay. So they will bargain for a higher price for their crops. Okay, Mr. Chira, as a cooperative, can you tell us how you yourself have benefited? I've benefited a lot. Mm -hmm. Dividend from there, which we received from a cooperative okay. after selling the produce. Okay. 
it's easy for them to be linked to other stakeholders. Okay. Yes, like for agro dealers, if they want to do purchasing, mm -hmm. it's easy for them. They can also do outgrowth scheme. Mm. It's very important. How does group purchasing work? Well, group purchasing is where farmers put together their monies to mm -hmm. purchase inputs. Mm -hmm. They select a supplier mm -hmm. who will supply them with the inputs that they require. Mm. It's possible for them to have a discount. Mm. Sure, unlike buying on an individual basis. And, then and they can get their inputs in bulk at once. Mr. Chirua, what is the most big thing that you've gotten through group purchasing? Transportation. Eh? Mm. If you put things together, mm. transport becomes very cheap. Well, that's all very interesting. But let's make it make sense. Let's get down to the details. Co-ops help cut the price of transport, saving money. Aggregation means buyers come to you rather than you having to find them. And co-ops mean you get a better price as there is more to sell. Can you explain to us the benefits that you've experienced in bulking, in aggregation? If you buy inputs in bulk as a group, it is cheaper. At the same time, the seller gives us free transport. From Lusaka to here. It is a saving to us. Before we started bulking, we used to sell our farm produce at a very cheap price. But now, with bulking, we get a good price. Uh, the other benefit is uh, we bring the, the market closer to us. So mm. in aggregation, we bring those buyers closer to us. You don't have to go looking for the buyers. The buyers come looking for you. Yes. Okay, that's very interesting. And I think that's something that everyone is benefiting from. Actually, the family is very excited with the farming. But not all of us, we can become farmers. That's why I send children to go to school, to learn various things, so that maybe some can become farmers, some can become doctors. About four of them is studying a degree at the university, agriculture, engineering which means the knowledge which is going to get there is automatically for farming. Sometimes I feel farmers think mechanization is not for them. It's too expensive. Some would rather trust in the old ways. But if you think the same, I think you'll be surprised by what we find out next. Our farmer Chirwa has purchased a two-wheeled tractor together with a two-row planter attachment thanks to advice he received from FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. It's all part of a project fully funded by the European Union. So I've asked expert Mwale Sekeni to help us find out how this can not only increase yield, but over time can help increase profits too. This looks like some heavy machinery. I don't know if I'm strong enough to operate this on my own. Yeah, you just need the manual, mm -hmm. that's all. And it is user friendly. I can see that uh, these planters don't necessarily look like they have uh, your traditional disc plow. How exactly then does this work? Yeah, if we look back, we used to use disc plows. Yes. In relation to the climate change and they're like... Right. That's why we are advocating for conservation agriculture now. Right. Yes, because when you use uh, a disc plow to plow your field, you are exposing much of your land to the atmosphere, to the right, sun. the rays. elements. Yes. Yeah. Uh, meaning you'll be losing a lot of water during the day. Right. If you did the reaping, mm -hmm. those lines will act like they are conserving moisture. Fantastic. Ah, Mr. Chiro, have you really seen how this has improved the way you farm? Before this, I could only manage seven to eight hectares. But yeah, that now after purchasing this, I'm at the range of 15 to 20 hectares. Wow, that's a lot of hectares. Yeah. Uh, another thing that is helping out our farmers, it is um, because it's using this mm -hmm. to hire it out. Right. It is uh, increasing income at a rapid rate because uh, they hire 
on planting, right. on transportation, right. all these are my income. So you're not just hiring it out on one basis. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the more you can reduce on labor, yes. the more you have time to manage other activities around the homestead. Yes, yeah. uh, the more you have uh, money in your, in your pockets. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> yes. This is a very, very good investment. Yes. So as we prepare the tractor, let's break it down and get down to the detail. A tractor with a seed planter like this is a big investment. But think of the savings that build up over time. Labour costs can be reduced by as much as 75%. Time savings by as much as 50%. Then there is the extra income from hiring the tractor out, as well as savings in seeds and fertiliser, as we will see now. And here it is in action. This looks amazing. I can see the tractor is very busy already. The man looks like a professional. He's just riding it very easily. Yeah? Usually I see these tractors with one planter, but you've got two planters attached. Huh? The two planters at a time, you see, time. Yeah, so you work twice as fast. Yes. One movement, it has the two loads. Exactly. Second movement, four loads. <laughs> I see, exactly. How does this thing work? Those yellow containers, we put fertilizer. Right. The red container is where we put the seed. Right. So yeah. what does the first blade do? It breaks the ground and the chaps so that they can disturb the planting system there. Breaking through the ground and creating the, the rows? The, yes. And then when we come to the middle blades, they look slightly different. They've got yeah, a sort of the, angle. When it moves, then it opens. The seed drops, it closes. Wow. It literally looks like it's swimming yes. in the sand. What's the next part that's coming at the back here? There is a wheel there. Okay. It has a spring there. Right. It is a balancing. So when the ground is uneven, you have the springs on both planters yes. to ensure that the, the seed is planted at the same the level. The same level. I see, yes. I see. Yeah, that's very smart technology in a simple looking machine. The spacing bar on the back of the planter can be adjusted to get the exact measurement recommended for the seed being planted. How long would it take before that you had these machines to come and help you doing this? You know, job? when you do manual, mm -hmm. it would take maybe six or eight hours to do. How many people would it take to do the work in those six hours? In the manual, so many people. Right. Labor is too high. But with this machine, it's only one and a half hour in wow. a hectare. It only takes one and a half hours wow. to work on about a hectare. Yes. <laughs> exactly. But the operation is done by one person. Yeah. So, what was the quantity of fertilizer and seed that you're using compared to now that you have this very smart tractor? In Imanyo, it's not done effective because uh -huh. it might drop the, the fertilizer uh -huh. too much or less. Okay, so you also run the risk of putting too little, yes, not um, only too much. Yes, uh -huh. but with the machine, when you calibrate it, it is the same size. Right, so the calibration with our tractor and the planters here, we make sure we put all our settings in correctly. Incorrect. Shows that we have just the right amount of the seed right amount. and just the right amount of fertilizer. Exactly. Thank you, Mr. Chirwa. So I'm sure you can agree that this new technology not only works faster than the old ways, but over time, it works out cheaper too. To those who are afraid for mechanization, they say it is very expensive. It's not expensive because there are NGOs which allow us you to pay in bits. You are given maybe a grant of three years. I think it's very simple to pay that in three years' time. Actually, let them not be afraid. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Wow. Good to see all of you here, Mr. Chira. Thank you very much for having us on your farm. Mr. Chira, what did you enjoy the most from our visit here? Lessons. Lessons? Mm, yes. What did you learn, Mr. Chira? Conservation. Conservation, right. okay. So, yeah, you learned a little bit more about conservation of farming. And when we come next time, what should Katanana and I expect to find on this farm? Big tractors <laughs> than that one. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Honestly, we've also learned a lot from you as well. Very true. So it's now time to say goodbye to you all. We'll see you next week on another episode of Mundo Mekopa! Thank you.